good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Emmanuel from GSMAI. And the next session will be about Open RAN maturity. So Open RAN is not a new thing, obviously. And we could see in the past half an hour how the vendor ecosystem developed so far, how operators are seeing uh, Open RAN these days. And in the next probably half an hour, uh, we would like to dig deeper where are we stand, how much is the ecosystem. So uh, I would like to highlight that it's so good to be back in physical conferences and these kind of opportunities, and especially very good to have a very uh, diverse mix of um, uh, panelists from software companies, from end-to-end -end vendors. So it's so good to see that uh, wide range of vendors will be here in the next session. So for the first presentation will be Greg Man uh, Manganello from Fujitsu, and I would like to call him to the stage. Thank you very much. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'd like to discuss, um, for the next couple of minutes, reducing ORAN adoption costs and increasing benefits. So we know ORAN is disruptive, but there are adoption costs. Let's take a look at that. And then what exactly are the benefits? Now, before I get started, does anybody remember reading a book? I brought one here. They say bring props. So this is a book. And the really nice thing about books, if I remember right, back in the day, the PDFs are pre-printed, like in sequence, in order. So it's really helpful. So speaking of PDFs, um, here's one now. Um, Crossing the Chasm is not a new book, but I think it's really applicable to ORAN right now. There is, um, we've been here since the beginning. There's innovators and early adopters, and uh, we heard from some just now in the first session. But take a look. I mean, NTT, Abet the Sun, I think his numbers were bigger than this, but I put down 13,000 open RAN base stations. Um, DISH has delivered cloud-native 5G ORAN to 120 markets, covering 20% of the population. And then Rakuten, I think your numbers were better than this, um, but significant CapEx and OpEx solution. So the early adopters have really done it, but now um, we're in that zone, crossing the chasm, and there's a lot of trials going on, as Luke mentioned, but, um, the, you know, what is the next step? How do we really look at that? So when I think about it, I kind of break it down to adoption costs versus benefits. And right now, maybe it's a little cloudy, and the more we can sharpen that up, I think the better for the industry. So we might be wondering, you know, what are the, what are the adoption costs? We know they exist. And one of the first things that I hear about is, Greg, what about integration? There's integration. Um, that's true. What about multi-vendor IoT and this kind of nagging issue about software maintenance? Sure, we heard about the benefits, but let's take a look at the, you know, a cost one by one. First of all, um, I can tell by looking around the room, some of you have been in the industry as long as I have, so... Um, 35 years or so, integration's not new. Now we're kind of looking at it from a multi-vendor perspective, but it's not, it's not new. Um, and, you know, if you talk to Mark Ruan from DISH, he's sometimes surprised that people think it's hard because once you get started and get going and the early adopters have done it, it gets easier and easier. The next one I want to kind of look at is multi-vendor IoT. So to me, this is a knowledge management problem. So as a 5G si -er, as we've been doing integrations with everybody on the RU, CUDU side, NFEI, server side, it's like putting books in the library, books in the library, books in the library, and others have been doing that too. Now we've got a set of knowledge, so it's not a desert start. It's getting easier and easier. From software maintenance perspective, you know, there is concern, you know, what about all the patches? Um, and then how do we keep it going? I mean, day one, SI is interesting, but day two, solution maintenance, to me, that's what it's really all about. 
don't get it working the first time, keep it working. So from uh, my perspective, um, let's unpack it a little bit. Um, software maintenance is no longer, or solution maintenance is no longer legions of engineers and technicians going to sites um, on maintenance windows. It's really done sort of step by step. As we kept it systematic and everybody working on the same system, it's become easier and easier. Um, I've seen uh, some strategies with centralized labs. Um, we have a mirror lab, other people have mirror labs, so that the whole solution can be pre-tested before production to build that CICD pipeline. Um, and then we've noticed a series of learnings that we've built into a playbook that's kind of a blueprint about what are some of the best practices, and happy to share that, that blueprint with you all. So software maintenance is actually quite doable. Um, I wanna bring up one new topic of automation, and it's been touched on by the other panelists, but you know, at first it looks like, hey, you're adding <laughs> yet another cost, but really um, it streamlines all the, other, all the other introduction costs. And let me just give you an example. Gone are the days where engineers are testing the solution with test cases and, hey, test ca uh, plan coverage and no overlaps but thoroughness. It's automated. So now the solution has test engines that are running. It's not nearshore, offshore, or onshore. It's automated. So from 100 tests to 1,000 tests to 10,000 tests a day, constantly running in the background. And what are we really doing is managing, from an engineer level, managing the dropouts. So taking a look with humans, what are the exceptions? Why did that happen? writing more test cases around that to prevent that from ever happening again, and then rerunning the engines. So now we've got the feedback loop to really shrink software and solution maintenance. So it's just bringing down um, all the adoption costs. Now let's take a look on the other side of the equation, um, benefits. So at first you're like, hey, um, you know, lower CapEx and lower OpEx, but let's take a kind of closer look at that. Um, it was kind of mentioned here before, but did anybody have a hard time getting components over the last year? I mean, it was chips this time, but, you know, we don't know what it's going to be next time, but wouldn't it be great to be able to um, have a mix and match scenario where you don't have to replace your entire infrastructure but if a different vendor can get you a component, it can drop in. So um, that supply chain resiliency, I think, is going to become increasingly important because it's going to be hard to predict where the bottleneck happens next. So that's, an, that's a new value. Another one um, that ORAM uh, provides us is RIC, multi-vendor AI and multi-vendor uh, automation. So, um, Yes, those are available in the industry, but now what we're talking about is across vendors and across geographies, across the whole network, so that we can really leverage the power of these technologies to drive up the benefits. Um, we're in a rowing family. I don't know if anybody else rows, but the interesting thing about this sport that my, my, my daughters taught me, you have to compete for your seat within the boat every week because the, po the coach wants to build the fastest boat for the team for the event. So it's a competition within the team and the team competes with other teams, so it's this perpetual competition. It's the same with ORAN. It's a perpetual competition that we always have to stay sharp. So that drives some of the faster innovation that Luke mentioned. And I wanna take a kind of closer look when um, Dish needed um, radios for their solution. They wanted a high performance, compact, um, multi band radio, not just for lower power, but lower tower leasing costs because leasing costs are based on wind load. So, you know, how many towers are there times 20% savings um, starts to add up to lower OPEX. Um, sometimes we had a long time for a feature request. 
Um, but now, in ORAN, we can use the silicon advancements and drop it in um, to the ORAN solution much, much faster. So now, ORAN's adopting the silicon curve, innovation curve. Say a third party's got a great idea about how to do power savings. That's um, even better than the vendors that provided it. We can drop it in, drop it into the solution. And again, you don't have to do the site visits for the software. Um, so there's this whole third party X apps and R apps for, um, I wrote there better efficiency. Those are the OPEX reductions. There's another whole branch for revenue production. So features don't have to just come from the RIC or the CUDU, they can come from the X apps with third parties. And so now we're building app stores to enable that ecosystem to come alive. And then from a security standpoint, since uh, attacks are a reality and more sophisticated, having new uh, vendors come up with new AI for anomaly detection and uh, to defending against attacks can really be enabled. So from the Fujitsu perspective, we're spending millions in R&D on the left-hand side and the right-hand side, along with um, some uh, investment from our Japanese government as well, to put together um, you know, these solutions. And then when we look at it, um, you know, the, the benefits are really coming together to cross that chasm. So just to kind of wrap up, raising our question, you know, the cloudy adoption costs at the beginning of this chat and the cloudy benefits are really a lot clearer to us that uh, we've reached that ORAN tipping point. The early adopters have paved that way. Um, the next set of uh, carriers can really rest easy that there's massive investments and the benefits are way outweighing the costs. And if you'd like to chat a little bit more about that, um, available after this or at our Fujitsu booth. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Greg. Very insightful presentation. And we have one more session from Cristina Rodriguez um, uh, before we start the panel discussion. So, Cristina, um, she is the vice president for, uh, for Intel. So, thank you very much. Stage is yours. This is maturity, right there in this map. And you probably have seen this today, more than one map. But this is exactly what is happening, where we have made a tremendous progress in the last couple of years. I would say we have reached the point of no return. Look at this. This is not only green fields, this is green fields and brown fields all over the world. We have done POCs, we have done lab trials, we have done field trials, but today we can say that the industry is deploying commercially at a scale virtual RAN and open RAN solutions with uncompromised performance metrics. Behind this, there is a technology that is mature, there is an ecosystem that is ready for innovation, and that there is an industry that is eager to be transformed. We know by now that in order for us to face the future, we need the best connectivity possible, enabled by the network, and for that, we need a network architecture and a network infrastructure that will allow us to deploy new functions quickly. We need the bright minds and we need all those developers in the world driving innovation into the network and making a reality our ambitions for the future. And that is why the industry created OpenRAN. OpenRAN is about lowering the barrier to entry so we can do much more. Let's remember one more time what is OpenRAN. It's about RAN disaggregation of software and hardware, running on general purpose processor, vendor neutral, 
general purpose processors with open interfaces and the rich ecosystem behind. We also know that software define everything and specifically virtualization all the way through layer one unlocks the biggest benefit possible. So when you take the principles open RAN and you put it together with the principles of virtualization, you get the maximum flexibility, you get the maximum scalability, and you get the biggest opportunity for innovation. Let's look at what is happening in the world right now, in the industry right now. Recently, Verizon announced that they have deployed, by now, 8,000 virtualized cell sites with a goal of 20,000 by 2025. By doing that, in their own words, customer benefit from greater flexibility, faster delivery of services, greatest scalability, and network cost efficiency. Vodafone, back in January, they turned on the first open RAN site. Recently, a week ago, a couple of weeks ago, Telefonica or Vision Media O2, they announced the first open RAN microsite also in the UK. Dish Wireless, back mid-year, they launched the first US 5G open RAN end-to-end -end cloud native. And since then, they have extended to more than 120 cities, extended their services to more than 120 cities. And by now, they are offering 5G broadband services to more than 20% of the US population. And then we have Rakuten Mobile. They have launched the 4G and 5G. We heard Sujil earlier. And by doing that, they have proved that Open RAN is ready, that Open RAN can scale, and that Open RAN can offer high density coverage in urban areas. The transformation to an open, flexible, cloud-native network is being led by an extraordinary ecosystem of companies that are driving innovation in all areas, geared toward fulfilling the operator's long-term goal for efficiency, sustainability, performance. And this is just some examples. You take, for example, Capgemini, applying artificial intelligence to their Mac schedule. And we're talking about all types of innovations here. You take the work that Ericsson and Intel have done, launching and talking about the, the magnitude of the ecosystem. Ericsson and Intel launched a tech hub, innovation tech hub, focusing on energy efficiencies, performance, time to market. Take um, Juniper with a radio intelligent controller and many AI-based applications, for example, Run Slice, that is capable of tracking in real time resources, radio resources, you, you, so you can make decisions on service prioritization. Canonical, with their Ubuntu 22.04, meeting all run requirements running with our Intel FlexRun software. Cohere, developing their universal spectrum multiplier, where they are seeing up to two times the spectral efficiency. The work that we did with Oran, within the Oran Alliance, we demonstrated a 12% of energy efficiency at the unit level, at the server level. DeepSeq, they're replacing a standard algorithms, L1 algorithm, algorithms for channel estimation and channel equalization 
with deep neural network based algorithm. And then last in this slide, but not least for sure, Microsoft taking signals and data from our FlexRAN software and applying to analytics for improving the user experience. And this is just a few, I, I could fill slides and slides with all the innovation that is happening today in the, in the industry. But continue talking about innovation. This week, Intel, during the Intel Innovation Event, Intel announced a new generation of processors. The fourth generation of Intel scalable processors with Intel VRAM Boost, in line with our commitments to continue enabling ecosystem innovation and flexibility. With respect to the third generation, the previous generation, this generation, this fourth generation, supports up to two times the RAM capacity within the same power envelope. So doubling the performance per watt. In addition to that, with Intel VRAM Boost, we have eliminated the need for any VRAM acceleration external card. You don't need, you don't need any more VRAM acceleration cards on those PCI slot, no SOC, no, no, no fixed function in those PCI slot. We have pulled in into the CPU everything that is needed to run the VRAM workload, fully in line, fully integrated. And with that, we're simplifying the design and we're also adding power savings to the system. In order to continue accelerating this transformation, we need the right technology. We need, a, we need a technology that can quickly adapt and scale. We need a technology that can be deployed at the data center, at the core, at the edge, and at the RAM with the same common platform and the same programming model. We need a platform that is easily programmed and effortlessly upgraded that allows the software vendors to have one baseline code and not many. In order to accelerate this transformation, we need a platform that is ready for innovation today and that has the flexibility and the scalability to grow into the future. Thank you. Many thanks, Christina. Uh, there is no way back. I'm going to use this expression. Thank you. Um, I would like to invite uh, Christina, please uh, uh, take a seat, and also Greg. And we have two new faces for the next session. And I would like to introduce you um, the next two speakers. One of them is from a traditional vendor, Ericsson. So Hashi Bakhtar, please. And, and also we have Rob Vilmos from, from Red Hat for the panel discussion. And Hashib, Rob, would you be so kind and uh, uh, introduce yourself in a few sentences, please? Sure. Uh, Rob Wilmoth. I'm a chief architect for Red Hat in the uh, telco media entertainment space. Uh, we've been working in this space for several years to help build a platform that is based on open interoper interoperability standards uh, to, to help uh, really make sure that everything we do here is uh, automated, repeatable, and secure. Thanks, Rob. Uh, Haseeb Akhtar, I work in the RAN advanced architecture within the North American uh, aspects of Ericsson. And uh, I'm also uh, Ericsson's delegate to Aura and Working Group 1, which is focused on architecture and use cases. And within Oran, I'm also the editor of the Oran architecture specification. 
So I kind of live and breathe or I'm pretty much uh, as my hobby, not my day job. <laughs> uh, but, you know, uh, on a serious note, Ericsson has been supportive of cloudification, um, RAN intelligence through enrichment, and even uh, open frontal enhancement. And uh, we have been, we, we have product on our cloud RAN portfolio as well as SMO, which some of you may know, uh, service management and orchestration. And um, since the inception of ORAN, we have been uh, one of the top two contributors in development of the specifications. Thank, th thanks, Rob. Thanks, Hashib. So we monitor open RAN deployments in the last few years. And currently, we see that there are around 20 commercial deployments. And another 70 operators planning to deploy open RAN in the next years, which is, I think, uh, an incredible number. And I would like to ask you, and I'm specifically very happy we have software companies and to end vendors here as well, that what do you see in 2022? What is the biggest blocking factor for operators to deploy uh, both Greenfield and, and Brownfield uh, open RAN networks? So, or I, can, we can start with Rob on, on, on that side. So biggest blocking factor do you see? Yeah, sure. So I, I think one of the biggest blocking factors that we see with, with any type of, of deployment is making sure that you don't necessarily over-rotate just on the technology. Uh, if we find that when an operator focuses too much just on the technical aspects uh, without taking a look at the process aspect and, and even the training of the people, uh, it, it creates a lot of uh, challenges and, and even so can contribute to increased cost and increased complexity. Uh, we also see that some of the physical aspects of the network uh, I mean, if, if you take away the technology for a bit and talk about the finances of it, uh, some of the networks are still being built out with legacy technology. So trying to understand how that brownfield aspect plays into what is becoming very quickly, and, and I mean, the point of this is to become a software-defined cloud-type architecture, those types of things, when you plan around them and you take into account the automation that needs to take place, uh, th those are really the biggest blockers that, that we see as we're talking to customers today. Hashim? Yeah, um, thanks, Rob. Um, I think I agree with what you said. I think we have talked about the integration challenges. I'm not going to uh, go into that. That has been you know, mentioned uh, quite a few times. I think one of the things that, um, you know, when we hit the reality, the cost and performance of the existing network, uh, we have to be on par with that or better. Right. So whichever way you slice it and, and dice it, that's the key thing that your supply chain or the CFO will sign the check. Uh, if, it, if that metrics is not met, that, that's not going to happen. The other challenge, uh, especially on the brownfield scenario, uh, there are some technology aspects that, that we need to know. For example, you know, if you want to support the LTE and the NR uh, with Open Run today, then you need a radio gateway on, on every site, uh, which will do your CIPRI to eCIPRI conversion. Uh, in terms of the power consumptions and some of the thermal capabilities, the COTS have to be on par again so that they are uh, you know, aligned with that on site if you want to do it. Uh, there are other aspects also. Uh, for example, if you are doing virtualization on a distributed RAN architecture or the DRAN architecture, then you really cannot commoditize as much of the virtualization unless you have other applications running on that. And actually, on cell sites, that opportunity is not very much there. And to take things into the CRAN or centralized RAN architecture, you have to you know, bring the sites into within the 15 kilometer range so that you have the, the, the radio processing timing you know, on, uh, on alignment. And that also creates some challenges with the backhaul fiber and all that. So those are some of the realities that, that you have to look at. And, and then apart from that, uh, nobody talked about this, which is the security challenges. Um, and you know, um, from Ericsson's perspective, we have pointed that out in October uh, 2019 with a white paper. And then later on, uh, German BSI recently said the same thing, similar things. Uh, EU recently did a whole lot of um, you know, study 
on, on the open run in general, and they also cautioned the operators to look at it carefully. And you can read through it. These are all on the, on the internet. And I think that's a little, a, my short list for now. Maybe we can go into other, other points later on. Um, just to let you know, please, if you want to comment the others, just feel free to, to we don't need to go in an order. Uh, so if you have any comments for someone else, just, just uh, please speak as well. Um, and also, uh, Greg, what do you think? Key bottlenecks? I'm going gonna, gonna to go back to SI. It may have been mentioned, but to me, it's sort of like if you don't know who the system integrator is, it's you. So they say that in poker, too, by the way. So um, I think it's really clear for operators to think through what business model that they're interested in. So what I mean by that is... Um, there's several different ones. I want to pick all the technology, and I'm the system integrator. It's okay. We've seen customers do that. Or um, I want a single point of contact. I might want to pick the technology, but I want someone to stitch it all together and be responsible for, uh, as a single point of contact, so sort of over, under. And then recently, there's some customers that have asked us to not only supply technology, but kind of be the side-by-side -side system integrator. So um, stitch it sort of like laterally this way. And so then they can rely on some of our knowledge and playbooks and blueprints so that it can be accelerated. So I think um, consciously uh, deciding how system integration is gonna be done at the, at the operator level is really good. I think where there's a barrier is when it's unconscious, sort of like it's gonna take care of itself and I think there's pros and cons to each, but it's important to make a conscious decision. I'll just comment on it, just to, to, to have it completely. So I, I tell you, I'm gonna answer your question in a different way. I'm gonna tell you what is not stopping okay. us from doing this, and it is the technology. I am absolutely convinced that the technology is ready. What we need to continue working on is in the mindset and how do we approach the problem? It's a different, we're doing things in a different way. Things that have been done the same way for a very long time, now we're doing it in a different way. We cannot do it the same way that we were doing it before. Right? So there's a little bit of mindset here, a little bit of muscles that we have to build, and there's a new skill set. But the benefit, and you were talking about that earlier, the benefits are clear. They're having a cloud native platform the flexibility, the scalability that you bring, absolutely uh, unquestionable. The, the, the skill set needed in this new world are available are, are all over the world. So, so the, the, technology, the technology is there. It, yes, it has to meet the, the performance metrics and, and, the, and the parameters. And I think seeing, and this is what I was mentioning this in my talk, the, the seeing companies such as Verizon, have deployed 8,000 and it's gonna continue deploying with a goal of 20,000. Seeing in, in, in this brownfield, uncompromised uh, key performance metrics there. Seeing Rakuten, now that's a green field, but it's still uncompromised key performance metric. I think that that's what builds the confidence as we see it more and more and we learn from each other, that will give us the confidence to move as fast as possible. Thank you. It's very interesting. Two years ago, we did a survey on, on the biggest bottlenecks, and we asked more than 100 operators. And it was so good to see that both of your presentation, you had, you actually named these issues and how could you overcome these topics. So, such as energy efficiency was a very big issue, or system integration security. So, it, it's in a relatively short period of time, we could see that there is an enormous amount of effort from the vendor side to overcome these issues and well I think just on that point it's like um, the, the point that uh, you're bringing up Christina is like um, it's not one company trying to solve the issue so identifying them benchmarking them that like Vodafone's been doing a fa fabulous job at and then many of us can team together and kind of attack them in either a cooperation or competitive manner but getting after it I think that's where the harnessing the innovation ability is really knocking down those barriers. Well, it, all, it also allows the individual participants to focus on what they're good at. Mm. And, and it allows them to not cross over into areas that 
maybe a different organization is better suited to fit for the operator's end use case. So with, with what we've been focusing on is obviously the platform. You don't want Red Hat to develop your 5G core, I promise. Uh, but from a platform perspective, from a security perspective, co collaborating with folks like Intel, working with Ericsson, making sure all of this comes together, that's where we're good at so that the other people on this stage and off this stage can, can also be successful for the end goal of the operator. I think that's, that's, a, very, that's a very good point. And we, talk, we were in a, in a panel earlier, or a round table, and we talk about this a little bit. There is, that's a very interesting thing, what you're saying. I think there is a little bit that we need to do as an industry, first to learn from each other, mm -hmm. but, but perhaps also to say, hey, let's not duplicate things, right? If you are already doing that, Maybe I can go and do something else and, 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 advance the, the, and advance the whole industry together. So maybe, maybe there is a little bit of that that we right. should explore as, a, as, a, as an industry. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. I think the, the collaboration and the competition will basically give way to the, to the best solution, right? And on that point, I'll give just one example. Like what we're doing with Intel, and you know what uh, Christina said about eliminating the PCI card, it's a it's a very important step. And at the same time, you know, I our friends in Rakuten just also announced, in you know, a couple of days ago, uh, with Qualcomm chipset, uh, which is uh, I don't know, uh, maybe I should not go into that technical, but uh, it, inline versus uh, in a look aside model where you have to have a, a PCI card in the way that you know, Rakuten and HP is going about. So we need to kind of see how this, this weighs out. But the reality of it is that when you go into standardization, and this is, I'm talking about from my architecture role and, and also in, the, in the, adapt, you know, the AL adaptation area, when we do the specification on that, you mentioned, Christina, that we want to have a one base software which is not going to be, you know, um, which has to be transportable across all platform. But with these two scenarios, Ericsson cannot build a software that will be applicable to both because it will be different. So we need to work and make an effort towards the standardization to make sure that we have an API or an interface that's equally, you know, uh, portable across all platform, right? So at and, and that time, and that collaboration and consensus has to happen within the industry to make things. Yeah, no, I, I, by the way, we're doing fantastic work together and, and it's great collaboration, a lot of innovation and you know, fantastic partners for, for many, many years. I think that's when we were looking at our commitment to the industry and, and our commitment to innovation, what we did that we just announced to pull in all the, all the VRAN acceleration within the CPU, that's what gives you that, right? Because you don't need anything else. So if you have a server architecture, that's your code. You don't need to have any other programming model. You don't need to have any other. That is, and that platform, you have it today where you can start innovating and you know that you can continue on the roadmap of the CPUs and the server architecture and, and you just ride that train. And you, don't, you only have one code to deal with. That's, that's, that was what it was in the, the what, what got us to go into that, into that path. From our point of view, um, yes, we have uh, ORAN RU, CUDU, SMO, but we're also an integrator. So mixing and matching, it's like, um, we're not looking for the one winning solution. There can be many winning solutions for different market segments. And I think that's one of the, one of the powers that we see is like, it can be a yes and situation rather than an either or or only. It can be this works here, this also works, this also works. So I think there's some real power in the, in the multiplicity of different models. Th thank you all. Um, I think what, we, what will be different in the next years is you have to convince different kind of operators to start their, their journey for open RAN. So, um, and I really like the indirect presentation, this kind of adoption curve and how you um, target different operators. And obviously- Yeah, that book was probably written before you were born. So really? It, yeah, it's like 20, 25 years old, so yeah. I, I'm, I'm way older than Okay. Right? I'm way older than 25. Um, so uh, I, I believe that 
obviously Vodafone and, and you see leading big operators who have like economy of scale to start mm. integrate themselves and we see that there are mainly three groups of operator if you're talking about open run one of them is who have the capacity and the will to do by their own and set up an R&D center in Malaga and spend a lot of effort in the second group like Vodafone the second group is is more like very big operators obviously but they are a bit earlier in their in this track and the third group of operators who 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 are happy to give happy to have like one dedicated system integrator and and I believe that's the long tail of of the market so we're talking about operators with less than 20 million subs and how are you planning to target the smaller operators from developing markets and will you do use a different method how to reach uh, operators uh, from, and there will be, I think, a different uh, challenge from, from, from a vendor perspective. So I'm not sure who want to start. Well, I, I mean, it sounds like you're reading our charts, but um, uh, not the ones I presented, but different ones. I, there are three ways to sell to the market, yeah. so for us. And um, to us, it's sort of like the periodic table of elements, and big operators may want to buy hydrogen and they're looking for the best, low cost, highest performance, most reliable, high. And so like, as an industry, or, and us too, we sell that and then put it. Other customers, SALT, NACL, put it together. Some of us think it's a food group. But anyway, SALT, and uh, it's kind of a bundle. That's that kind of next tier. Can you bundle some things? And then the last one wants us to build a house by the lake. You pick and assemble and make the living room face the lake so I can watch the sunset. So there's three predominant modes and um, it's important to say how the customer wants to acquire and, and what they're thinking, what they're capable of and what they want to do themselves and what they want others to do. And um, you know, if or when we get it wrong, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't fit because they really want to do their way. So our, our job is to discover how do you want to do that. Now we can discuss the pros and cons of each, but it's important to pick what style of procurement or how, you, how do you want to go about it. So that's, that's our experience. I think I, I, would, say, I, would, I would say the, the, the motivation for the smaller operators is not that different to the motivation mm -hmm. from the bigger operators. At the end of the day, you have to have OPEX and CAPEX benefits, and you have to have innovation benefits. And, uh, and I, I will go back to when you have a platform, a common platform that you can deploy everywhere that is cost effective and that brings you all the developers of the world to support that platform and to innovate in that platform, then you can scale up and scale down. We have seen this in, in uh, everywhere, in other places in the industry. Um, I think that's a very, very um, attractive proposition. Take a server and run your, your ground load. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Do you think smaller operators and the future um, operators who will, that 40 operators who are planning to build an open architecture, do you think they want to rely more on the vendor or they be the same level of uh, independence. It, it, on that, I, I agree. There will be, there will be some that would, that would say, I, I want to be the integrator. Yeah. And there will be others that would say, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look for help on the integration of this, or, or I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look for blueprint that already exists. So I'm going to look for somebody that has done it before so I can reuse that, that experience. So I think, I think that is going to be a little bit of, uh, yeah. a little bit of, a, a little bit of everything. Hasib or, or Rob on, on this end? Yeah, no, I think that they have already mentioned it. I mean, the economic of scale is a big motivator. I mean, you know, it's a big motivation for, for doing all this. And if we are able to achieve that, then of course, you know, the small, big, all operators are, are, are going to be benefited. But I, I will go back to my point is that the collaborations and consensus driven approach towards the standardization is very imp important and interoperability is a key aspect and that needs to be achieved through testing agreement 
you know, and it has to have the economic driver benefits for everybody that participates in it, right? So, so that's true for a small and big operator both. Yeah, I, I would say that the, the interoperability, the business value and benefits that, that we've already discussed a couple of times now, and then furthermore, taking the fact that the, the cloud native architectures that the smaller operators are potentially already using in their inter internal IT data center for their OSS BSS applications, you can take a lot of those lessons learned, at least from the initial rollout and how to make the thing work. And, and roll that straight into the network. Uh, a lot of the topics and technologies are gonna largely be the same. Um, as you get into that interoperable situation, you, you may find that certain pieces even need to get swapped out. You, you may end up saying, well, I'm starting with hydrogen, but I'm gonna eat salt. Uh, okay, bad example. But it, it, it goes along with it. And so that interoperability and, and maintaining very strict standards as to what that interoperability needs to look like is going to be incredibly important. If you cut a corner with your planning process or with your rollout from any point, you have to consider how that impacts what you're, you're looking at from a monetization of technical debt and understand, okay, if I make this decision here and I go a little bit away, how much is it going to cost me to get back with the next iteration of this? Now, that's not to say you need to be paralyzed, but as long as you understand and account for it, it can be okay. So I think that for the smaller operators, they're, they're still trying to struggle with how do I account for these types of changes and is this the right direction for me? And, and you know, fortunately, we're starting to see the economies of scale at some of the larger operators and that's gonna have an effect as to how confident uh, the other operators or, or even other areas of industry that want their own type of VRAN solutions that may not even be traditional uh, MNOs are going to start rolling these types of solutions out. Thanks. Um, there was a lot of example uh, about deployments in the past two presentation and both Greenfield and Brownfield. And do you think there is a different how operators, um, so what are the most important aspects when they deploy Brown or, or, a, or a Greenfield de deployment for Open RAN? So when you speak with your clients or potential clients, what do you think, what are the most relevant aspects? Well, I, um, maybe I'll, I'll start. Uh, yes, obviously they're different, but I think um, you, you mentioned mindset, Christina, and I, I love that, that concept because I, I think it's um, looking beyond the status quo for more possibilities, but the advantages may not always be exactly where they were before. And so um, being able to be open to um, look for advantages that aren't necessarily on the standard list is, is really important. So as we talk with brownfield operators, it might be this is the set of um, things we're looking for and then we can augment that to other advantages and other aspects that aren't always visible at first blush. So it's not, we can't use our intuition from how we've done things always, we have to keep looking beyond. Yeah, so I guess there are few things that are common for both brownfield and greenfield, right? So the ones that we mentioned earlier, the integration challenges, you know, everybody has to solve that. Uh, cost and performance parity, everybody has to address that. Um, and then also there is another aspect which is the, the specification readiness. Uh, you know, you, you're building something, so for example, you know, today's uh, deployment that, for example, Rakuten Symphony has, you know, it's, it's still, there are a lot of things in it that's not been percolated into ORAN specifications or things that are being still in flight has not been implemented into the field because some of the specs are still, we're, we're still writing it, right? So, so that's one of the things that everybody has to, um, you know, uh, agree on. And then I'd like to just, you know, mention that we, when you talk about Open RAN, it's a very loaded term. Uh, you know, it has a lot of aspects of it. So, you know, it has meaning to, you know, uh, I mean, everybody has a different interpretation of it. So I would say that it should be staged in a way that based on the, the availability of the 
benefits of that are available of that specific part. For example, cloudification. You know, it's you know, Verizon has done 8,000 of it, and you know Rakuten has some you know good numbers on that. So that's one of the things that we should you know go f go forward with, or that could be started first, or as an initial aspects of it. Uh, then there is an RAN intelligence aspect. Uh, you know, RAN intelligence from the management aspect, for example, from the non-real-time RIC, that has made some, quite a bit of, you know, improvement. There are a lot of products out there. Um, we have our products, Ericsson included, uh, and our friends also have a lot of products in that. So that could be next approach towards it, just to, to look at it, that what and how we can do that. And then comes the, uh, you know, the other areas in terms of the RAN desegregation, you know, the open front hall or the E2 interface and, and so on and so forth, right? So that would be another aspect. And then in the, in the greenfield scenario, you know, whenever you build a new interface, the, the scale deployment of it has to be, you know, proven, like Rakuten is doing it. You know, they are talking about a very crowded market in Japan being on par with uh, their you know, brownfield competitors. So that has to be done, you know, in, in a greenfield scenario. And on the brownfield aspect, there's something specific that, you know, needs to be also understood. If you, are have, if you have a legacy network, then there has to be a way to, to, to interact or interface with them. For example, if you have a legacy management system, and if you are bringing this new open SMO, for example, you know, how are you going to interact with them? How are you going to collect the data from, uh, from both network and how are you going to consolidate them? If you're bringing in our apps, for example, to do some sort of uh, optimization, any kind of optimization in the network, how are you going to collect the data that has both mixed mode in your network, right? And then I mentioned about the radio gateway and there could be other scenarios like that. Uh, if you already have a distributed RAN architecture, then are you going to go stay with distributed RAN or are you trying to move into more of the centralized RAN architecture? Uh, what type of backhaul capability you have? What type of front haul you have? Do you have fibers? Do you lease fiber? So all of those things has to be understood and then hopefully you have a good business case and then you move forward. I think in an in a oversimplified response to your question, the green fields had to be as good as the brown fields, and the brown fields has to be as good as the brown fields, right? So you, you start something from scratch, you have to be as good as, as, as table stake, and if you have already a brown field, whatever you come with, it has to be as good. So that's, that's and then from there it is, well, but that's not, the, that's not the end of it. Now you have all this possibility to both be much more better and have much more benefit to the, to the users and to, and to your own deployments. So that's, that, that's, that's, that's what we need to go to. That's, I think that's a very good way to articulate what I mentioned. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And then from a brownfield operator standpoint, um, our discussions are about entry point. Is it new spectrum? Is it refarmed spectrum? Is it a new use case? Is it a new geography? So finding the entry point to get started, I think is really sort of the art of the possible. And then, yes, many things have to be discussed and decided, but um, to get started, it's the entry point. So that's the, um, Greenfield operators don't have to talk about entry points because they just enter. But Brownfield, it's a good discussion of entry point. What we've been noticing with some of the customers and operators that we've been working with is that with the Brownfield uh, methods, uh, or if you're going into a Brownfield environment and you're starting to do the process, what you also have to account for that a lot of people don't is when you upgrade one part of the system, you can take either the, the economies of scale, the lessons learned, the automation orchestration strategies, uh, API management, whatever it happens to be, and start actually recognizing value, business value and business return on other parts of the network immediately. And so we've seen customers uh, upgrade one piece and then put a end-to-end -end automation orchestration engine underneath it, and now even legacy pieces that 
you are you had slated for upgrade or slated for removal next, okay, maybe that's no longer your next entry point. Maybe you go on to something different because you've seen uh, something as a result that, that you didn't exactly expect. So uh, the, the guidance is, you know, as you plan things out, go back to the drawing board and, and replan and make sure that as you're doing your testing of individual pieces and parts, because, you know, flipping a switch and moving everything over all at once, maybe that's not, you know, the best way to do it. Maybe you need to stair-step your approach. Thank you all. And I will have one last question. It wasn't in the, in the, in the, in the plan, but I, I, I will probably ask, do you have a message, uh, a recommendation for the industry just in, in one sentence, like is there any, it can be very specific, but a key message, how would you like to, to end up this session from your side? So it can be a very specific recommendation or it can be a more general one, but I think we are reaching a new phase. Um, and I, I'm going to repeat Christina with this, there is no way back. And I think in this new phase, we know that it's technically capable. We have great examples, uh, both Brownfield and both Greenfield, but do you have any specific message um, for, for the industry for the next years? Um, how would you like to um, close down your, your part? So. You want me to start? Yeah, if you so, want. So, yes, I think, I think I will say, let's make sure we, we pick a platform, we deploy a platform that can scale and can be flexible and can grow into the future, but also that it matches what we're trying to accomplish with open RAN and virtualization of the RAN. Let's not pick something that is a little bit custom or a lot custom and a little bit open or a lot custom and a little bit virtualized. Let's go with virtualization all the way and uh, give it the best chance for this to, to succeed and for this to be the, the transformation and the revolution that we're expecting in the industry. Thank you, Christina. Greg? Thank you. Um, I guess mine was going to be um, let's engage and collaborate. Just really simple. Um, we really enjoy our ecosystem partners. We'd like to have more. Let's engage and collaborate, and we're going to do this together. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. Yeah, I would say that, you know, by Ericsson's Cloud Run and SMO, our product is called Blub. No, on a serious <laughs> note. <laughs> but, but, but just to finish, it's called Ericsson Intelligent Automation Platform, EIAP. We spend a lot of time, you know, uh, working it out. But no, I agree with, um, you know, what Greg said. Uh, collaborate, build consensus. You know, spec is a very important aspect, the specification is something that shows that the industry has agreed on something. And the reason I say that, you know, before even Open RAN, uh, you know, ever, ever talked about, we already had an open system. I mentioned it in, the, in, the, uh, in, in our workshop earlier, that the interface between the mobile node and the radio system today called EUU interface, it is open, as open as it can be. You can buy Qualcomm phone and run on Ericsson network, and you, know, you can buy somebody else's phone and you know, buy on other people's network worldwide, go everywhere, and it works, right? So it, it, and that is because you have a very solid specification and solid interoperability testing and protocols and so forth. So please come and contribute in, in ORAN specs. Let's build a very solid and robust spec so that we can get this with the right footing. Thanks, Ahib. Rob? So I would say the, the, one of the biggest mistakes that we see that, that I would like to see eliminated is uh, reinventing the functionality of the communities. And, and I'm not just talking about open source communities or upstream communities, or, or I'm, I'm talking about any communities where you're participating in creating a standard. Because what ends up happening is if you reinvent the functionality of whatever community it happens to be, the next time you go to upgrade, you have to reinvent the reinvention of what you just did. And every time you iterate, it just creates a massive, massive headache. And it also impacts the interoperability that we're all going for. So as you move forward, if you find a situation where you're like, I, I have to reinvent that, that suggests an inflection point to re-engage with the community to find out what's being done in order to accommodate that economy or that, that piece that you need. Uh, we've seen a lot of organizations mandate that they have to have administrative access to the platform to even function. No, you don't. 
we've found ways around that. So that's a, a single example, but we encounter this all the time. So finding ways to avoid that reinvention, avoiding that going off into your own customized realm uh, is only going to help the not just your own organizations, but the entire community in which you operate be more successful, create more innovation uh, through competition or co collaboration, uh, and, and ultimately result in our own operator community being able to move faster. Brilliant. Thank you, Rob. So once again, it's a very great panel, and I personally find it very insightful. Um, hopefully see you very soon. So I would like to say thank you very much for all of you. So Christina, Greg, Hasib, and Rob, thank you so much. And um, the next session is on. Thank you.